worthy to be praised. You can go ahead and take your seats tonight. Amen. Come on, let's give the worship team, amen, a good clap. They have been doing a tremendous job of, of really just ushering in the presence of God. They make it so much easier to come up here and communicate, amen, God's word. And so that's very important. Those of you who are, 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 are preachers and teachers and ministers, you guys know how important that is. And so I want to thank you guys uh, for, for, for allowing me to come into that, amen. Amen. I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to James chapter 5. As I just go ahead and fix up this. The fifth chapter of James. That's why. I want to read. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read very familiar scripture here this morning or this evening. But I want to talk about the fervency of prayer. I want to talk about the agony of prayer and, and why sometimes God, you know, puts us in those situations and, and puts us into those times where, where, where true communication comes out, true calling out to God, true prayer, true agonizing, true comes out because of the places that we're at. And there's times you're going to see here tonight that there's times where God hears your prayer but it's just not your time yet. We, we're not ready for that. How many ever asked for something and, and it, it, man, you're still waiting on it? Right? You've been praying for something and then some things come to pass and some things don't. Well, I believe that in God's sovereignty, there's a reason for that. But in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says to confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man like nature, with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that he would, it, it would not rain. And, he did not, and it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Let's pray. Father, I come before you here tonight. And Lord, I thank you, God, for your strength, God, and your power and your enablement to communicate. I ask that you would move aside every hindrance, God, every distraction from our hearts and minds. And, and that you would lock us in into your word that would be that lamp unto our feet. Your word that would produce, God, a, a, a fervency to know you, Lord God. To understand, Lord, what you're doing and taking place within our life. We, we just cast our dependency upon you. We acknowledge, God, that we need you. We can do nothing without you. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. How many have ever felt dry when you pray? Huh? They ever prayed and you just got there, you begin to pray, and it just seemed like it wasn't going nowhere? You, you, you begin to look at how you feel and relate that to, was it a good prayer? We relate to our prayer life is, is whether it's consistent. Uh, we, we, we measure, uh, it, man, do we have a powerful time in prayer uh, if, it, if it felt good? I think all of us here tonight want a fervent prayer life. We want, uh, we want to be able to pray with fervency. The word fervent means with passion. It means hot. It means to be able to pray with some emotions, Right? And see, that's what one of the biggest lies of the enemy coming into the church or even doing anything for the thing for God is he plays with our emotions. He plays, he plays, he's very good at playing on how we feel. And we so much are a people that based on how we feel, on how we think. How many ever thought themselves to be sick? You know what I mean? I feel sick, and then the more you think about it, you get sicker and sicker. Well, I was trying so hard not to do that today. I'm feeling it, but I don't want to think it, but man, I'm feeling it. We can talk ourselves, and all of a sudden, you're dying. I said, no. He, he does that with prayer. He plays with your emotions. So tonight, I want to be able to go into a, 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 a part of the, of the Bible, and we want to see somebody that, if there's anybody, if there's anybody that is praying with intensity and has a reason for it, is this particular biblical character. But before we go into that, I want to be able to go ahead and just set the ground because I think to have a sense of, and, and, and a hot prayer, if you want to say, man, God, I need to know that I'm praying to you, 
I think the bottom ground or zero or, 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 or ground zero for that is really to understand that you are in the presence of God and have ability to come into his presence is based on nothing that you did. You see, what God has done, and when you come into the presence, we, that is our privilege based on not what you have done, not based on how good you have done, not based on how much you have prayed or not prayed. It's based on what he has done. And so ground zero is to be able to understand. It's to be, it's to be able to understand that coming into his presence is a privilege. It is a privilege. In Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, I'm going to read just two scriptures just to set the ground before we go into talking about this particular person. Because I think it's very important, even tonight being all my prayer, is that we understand that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The righteous man is not one who's not only living a holy life, but also one who's understanding that who God is and what he's done for us. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood. You know that when we come into the presence of God, it is the holiest place. Do you see that here tonight? Do you see God's presence as the holiest place? You see, sometimes we don't because it, we, we can't see past ourselves sometimes. Do you understand that? Some of us, God, we are in a holy place. My prayer is that we are on holy ground. But sometimes we cannot see that because we cannot see past ourselves. The devil is very good in condemning us and reminding us and bringing it up. Even in the presence of God. The Bible says what? The devil would go before the throne of God and accuse the brethren day and night. He's the accuser of the brethren. But the Bible says, it says that we're able to come with boldness by the blood of Jesus. A, a new and living way that he's consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest in the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart full assurance. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed by the pure word. You know that when you're in the presence of God here this evening, something's taking place. When you understand that you are in the holies of holies, the Bible says that something is taking place within your heart, that the blood, uh, the blood of the lamb has been sprinkled upon our evil conscience, and that God is washing us with his word. Think about that. Something is taking place within your heart. Something is taking place within your conscience. How many come in and we got a conscience? We think about things. Yes, even in service, we think about things. We can be caught up in the word or we can be caught up in, man, am I going to make it tonight? I'm already tired. Those are just normal things that happen. I'm not trying to, that just happens. But what I'm trying to say is that you have to continue to remind yourself that you are in the presence of God. There is something happening in within your conscience. And God is preparing your heart for the word because it's through the word that he washes you. It is the word that he purifies you. In Hebrews chapter 4. Another familiar scripture. The Bible says. Let's see, we can start here for the Word of God. Um, when it talks about the Word of God, listen to what is taking place right now. Very familiar scripture. It says, for the Word of God is a living and sharper and powerful than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints of the marrow. It's in the center of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There is no creature hid from his sight, but all things are naked and open before the all-seeing eyes of God we must give an account to. Something is taking place here. When the word of God is going forth, it is, doing, it is preparing you so that God is able to go within your conscience and the intents and the motives of your heart and bring you to a place where you understand that you are in the presence of God. In 14, he says, since we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Over and over in the, Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews, you're going to hear it say, hold fast to your confession. Hold on. 
over and over he says it because they were a people who were um, uh, passionate for God and they allowed the other the uh, old Judaism come in and, and the ways of life to come in and pull them back and therefore the Hebrew writer continues to say hold on hold on hold on to your confession for we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but at all point was tempted as we are yet without sin therefore there it goes again therefore come boldly into the throne of God that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I see a picture. I see a picture that God is saying, hold on, but understand that, that, that when you're into the holy place, you can come with boldness, but not based on who you are. Boldness by understanding who he is. We got that tonight. I want to set that ground because when we go ahead and look at this particular scripture, this lady... If there's anybody, if there's anybody who had a reason to give up in prayer, was this particular person. If there was anybody who was able to say, God, I'm no longer man, if you're not going to give it to me, I give up. How many ever just gave up stop, and, and stopped praying for something? Come on, be honest, you just stopped praying for it. Why? Because you just come to the conclusion that maybe that's just not God. Well, tonight I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel. And we're going to talk about this individual, this lady. Remember, we're talking about passionate prayer. We're, we're talking about prayer with fervency and, and agony. And, and if you look, it, it, the, the closest one you can begin to understand this type of prayer is when Jesus was praying there at, at, at the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And the Bible says he prayed with such intensity that it appeared to be drops of blood coming down on, 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 on from his brow. There was, there was a prayer of agony and intensity, but yet it was a prayer of submitting to God, not my will, but your will be done. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to read a story about a lady named Hannah. Many of us heard of her. A lady who was there, who was, was married to a, a, a man of God, was married to a priest. And, and so we, I want you to go ahead and look at it. We're going to just point out a couple of things about her predicament, about her prayer, about her, her, what she went through, and how it was so easy for her just to give up. And then there's a good side to this story. Amen. Are you guys ready? In 1 Samuel chapter 1, let's begin reading from verse 2. And he had two wives, and the name of them was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peniah. And he had, and Peniah had children, and Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli, um, Hophanani and uh, Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, there, th were there. And wherever the time came... Um, El Elkaniah to make an offering to the Lord. Uh, he would give a, a, a portion to Penaniah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would, only, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord closed her womb. And her rivals also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was that year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she was, uh, uh, went up to the house of the Lord, that she was provoked her, and therefore she wept and did not eat. A story of a lady who loved God, a story of a lady who, who was married to a man of God, but yet the Bible says she could not have no children, right? And in the Bible days, and in those days, it was, it was very disgraceful. It was a reproach for a woman not to be able to bear children, especially not to be able to bear a, a male child. That was like what they, that was their goal was to be able to have to give a male child to their to their husband or to produce an offspring that would create a legacy or inheritance. And so the Bible says that that she could not uh, uh, produce or her womb was closed, and because of that, she suffered. How did she suffer? The Bible says that she was provoked. 
That Bible says that her, her that, that at that time they were able to have more than one wives. Only at that time. Okay, let's, let's pay attention here. They were allowed to have more than one wife. God allowed it because in his sovereignty and in his wisdom, that's what needed to be done. And to a certain point, he said, no longer. But in any case, he had another, they had another wife. And I don't know if you guys have ever been teased before. How many got brothers or sisters? How many remember growing up being teased? Huh? I, I, I remember some of the hard, crazy, hurtful things they would say to you. Huh? I remember getting beat up all the time. I remember getting bullied. I remember getting come and cry, baby, and you're spoiled and get away. I mean, I, I was provoked and I was, but in her case, she was provoked in the sense that, look, at, ah, I got children, you don't. See ever happen? I got candy, you don't. I got this, you don't. But because it was such a disgrace, she was being constantly provoked. She was constantly put in a position where, where God, why is this happening? What I, what, I like, what I like about this particular scripture and this particular story is some of the things that she did. See, even though in spite of what her, what she was going through, in spite of understanding that she could not have kids, the Bible says that, 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 that she endured it. You see, it's easy for us to come to a place where when we're not getting what we want, the devil provokes us and hits us over and over so we can easily just stop praying for it. But what I love about this individual is that the Bible says that as, she, as her husband went to the, to the prayer temple yearly, she constantly asked God, I need a son. I need a son. Bless me with a son. You see, in her case, year after year of not having a son, a year after year of lacking something in your life, year after year of being in the same place, in the same place spiritually can create a sense of bitterness, can even create confusion. The Bible says she was even depressed that her, that her husband came out to see where she was and as she looked by the doorpost, she was sitting there and I'm, I'm sure she even had the, the, the thoughts of committing suicide. It was unheard of. But when you're going through some kind of a situation like that, it produces confusion. How I many you know the devil plays with your emotions? Huh? The Bible says that there she was, year after year, she would begin to pray. Year after year, she would ask God, God, why have you closed my womb? Notice this, that it wasn't that she didn't have children because something was wrong. The Bible directly says that God closed up her womb. Why would God close up her womb? Why would God allow her not to have children or not allow her to have children? Why? Do you ever feel like sometimes God is trying to take something from you? Huh? Be honest. Sometimes you, sometimes he does. Sometimes you feel like, God, why? Why are you doing this to me? He does it because when he closed up his womb, he had a greater plan. And by closing up her womb, a prayer, a fervency came out of her. Every time she went there, it was a cry. It was no normal prayer. It was something from deep down. God, oh, deliver me from this. You see, fervent prayer has to come from wanting to get closer to God, from wanting to advance his kingdom. See, too many times our prayers are selfish. They're for us. That's not right. I don't say all our prayers. I don't think all of them. But I think when we think about it, God, help me. Help me do this. God, bless me. Help me grow this. Help me do this. God, I need this. It's always a need in which God asks us for that. But true fervent prayer comes out knowing the big picture that you want to advance the kingdom and God's agenda. Because that's what God was doing. God was preparing her, amen, to do something that, man, no other woman could do. And she gave up something and she produced something that no other woman could have done. The agony of prayer of every year being able to go there and being able to say, God, give me that. Give me a child. Not only does she have to deal with, with, with not having a baby and feeling approach, but she also had to deal. Remember, she had, her husband had another wife. So she had to deal. With, there was competition there. You know? She had to see her husband 
go and, and lift up offering for her, her kids. And then when it came to her, she had no kids. But listen, God is so good. Listen, if you're praying for something, and that something has to do with, man, God, change me so that I can be effective. God, change my situation so I can advance. Change me so that, God, you can do more. See, fervent prayer comes because God puts a fire in it, and he puts fires on the prayers that are going to advance the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean that you can't pray for something for yourself. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there's a bigger picture. We're here tonight because it's International Prayer Night, right? And so all over the world, we're praying not only for our churches, but we're praying for the world. We're praying globally for people that would come to know who Jesus is. So there she is. She's, been, she's having to go through this process of, of not only being provoked and talked about and being made fun of, but also having to share her husband with another woman. Turmoil. Can you imagine what she's going through? Can you imagine the mind games that the devil would go? Huh? How many here find it hard to pray when you're going through some things? There he is, the devil, over and over, reminding you, reminding you. And it's hard to get breakthroughs because this noodle of yours is so focused on other things. I find that the, that, that the answer is this. The answer is not so much praying for my situation any longer. It's, it's acknowledging him and God, helping me see what the bigger picture is. What is the bigger picture? What is the bigger picture of what I'm going through? Why, God, why should you help me financially? Why, why should you give me a bigger job or a better job? Why should you bless this or bless my kids or bless? It should be so that they, our kids are blessed and they come to know the Lord so that they can grow up and win souls. God wants to bless you with a, a job that pays more, that has good hours, so that you can be a more of an asset to the body of Christ. See, put your prayers in perspective in what God has called you to do because in the long run, None of this is going to be here. We're, this, we're not going to take anything with us. It's all going to stay right here. And so I come to understand that, that this is all temporal, Paul says. But the seen, what we see is temporal. But that which is unseen is eternal. And too many times we pray with the eyes of, of what's seen. We see it. Listen, lift up your eyes and where the, uh, see where he comes. It, it's eternal purposes that God wants to accomplish to our life. Do you believe that? That's what prayer does. Think about it. It's, we're mortals, and we're praying to an almighty God that has all powerful. He, he knows all things. He sees all things. He can be everywhere at all times. Do you see who you're praying to? See? Again, sometimes we don't because we can't see past ourselves and our situation. See, she's seen the bigger picture. She was there every year. Every year she's praying. Praying, God, give me children. Give me children. Give me children. In other words, she was saying, let me bear fruit. I was explaining to, to, to many times we want to bear fruit, whether it's spiritually or whether it's disciples or in our life group. Why do we want to bear fruit? It's not just to be big. We, we do not want a big church just to have a lot of numbers so that we can say that. I don't want to have a, a big life group or a, a good ministry just to be able to say that. My Bible tells me that if I abide in him and his word abides in me, that I'm going to bear fruit. But that fruit will remain and glorify his name. I come to understand that anything I do has to glorify his name. Paul says, whether I eat or I drink, I do it for his glory. Start reading. When you start reading the Bible, you begin to see this picture that there's a thread of truth in each one of those letters. Everything he did was to bring glory and honor. You want to bear fruit tonight? Whether it's spiritually, whether it's in your ministry, whether it's in your family home, then listen, put your eyes in the head. It's for his glory and for his honor. You see, because if it's for his glory and honor, whatever you go through, you're going to know it's because he allowed it, and if he allowed it, he's going to pull you through it. You believe that? You see, he, she was one of those individuals that was crying for, for, for a child. And when I think about that, I think about Ray, uh, uh, Rebecca, who was praying for a child also. She was almost in a similar situation. She was married to, uh, to um, Jacob, and, and she, 
She was being made fun of. She, she couldn't have no children. But her prayer was, give me children or I'll die. I, I hear that, that small prayer. Give me children or I'll die. There is so much intensity. There is so much fervency in that small prayer. See, it's not how long you pray. It's not so much on, on how many words you say. It's what you're saying. And, 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 it's, and in those words, how much intensity and fervency are in those words. Does that make sense? It's not how long. That's what Paul, that's, that's what Jesus meant. Don't be like the Pharisees who speak long words. See? But their hearts were far from him. No, it's not, it's not how long. God will develop you to pray long. For those of you who pray, who prayed an hour, two hours, it was, it was like, man, you're, you're locked into the presence of God. And all of a sudden they're saying, okay, it's time to go. Like, where did time go? See? God, God develops you to that place where you have the discipline to not only physically, but mentally and emotionally to stay connected to God for that period of time. God pushes you there. Little by little, he pushes you there. Because he sees and he looks at the fervency of your heart. See, Hananiah prayed, or H Hannah prayed, and the Bible says she finally, finally God gave her that child. What, what I mean by the bigger picture, why did God answer her prayer? Why did God answer her prayer this evening? I'm going to close with that. After year after year, if it was God who closed up her womb, it comes to the place where now God hears your prayer, and then God says, okay, because of that prayer, listen to this prayer. In Samuel chapter... First Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. We'll close with this. I want you to go and pay attention. Why did God, if it, if it was God who closed up her womb, why did God allow her to have a child? What changed God's mind? In First Samuel chapter 1, verse 9, it says, So Hannah arose early after they had finished eating and drinking in, Sh in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting at the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she said, and, and, she was, and she was in bitterness of the soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. I mean, a fervent prayer. It, it was a prayer with intensity. It was, I, mean, she, I mean, you can really feel this prayer. And she said, then she said and made a vow to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, the host, if you will indeed look on my afflictions with, of your maidservant and remember me, not forgetting your maidservant, but will give me a maidservant, a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall touch and come upon his head. Verse 12 says, and so it happened that she continued to pray before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. And the Bible says, and now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but the voice was not heard. And it goes on to say that God gave her that child. But why? Why did God change? Because listen to that. God, if you give me this, it's, it's for you. God, this child, I, I don't just want it so that they can stop making fun of me. I want it because it's for you. I, I want to dedicate them to you. See, anguish and fervent prayer stem from being able to see the big picture. God wants to answer some of our prayers. God wants to move within our life, but sometimes we don't see the big picture, and so he's there. No. No. And he gives us little victories here and there and sh just to show that he's still with us. Because I'm going to know if God didn't do nothing, we'll begin to say, man, God left me. So God does. He shows you, okay, I'm still with you. But we can't imagine what God wants to do with them. Some of your prayers, will, if they were to come to you, would change the world. Some of your prayers, if they were answered, would change your family. If some of your prayers that were answered that you're praying would change this city. It would change everybody that you affect and influence. But it cannot be for us, church. It has to be unto him. It has to be for his glory and honor. And as we go ahead and stand, let me ask you, let me let, me let you know this too. Is that when I begin to ask God, how do you get us from that place? 
How do you get us in that place where we truly know we're doing things unto you? How, how, do, you, how do you get us to that place where, where, where we're asking for and, and we, we really know it really is unto you? How, how do I know that there's not something inside me that's really praying for, that I have wrong motives and praying for it? Well, what God does is he begins to test your motives through your life situations. He, he uses people at work. He uses people that you hear in the church. He uses your leaders. He uses people that ask. He uses tools and instruments to dig out, to, to, to discern the intents of your heart. He, 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 he looking for true motives to be pure, pulled out. But that only happens when those motives are tested. And we miss those. You know what I found out? I missed a lot of tests. I missed, I missed a lot of, I, I, I didn't realize that that was God testing me. I, I didn't realize that, that it was God trying to see how I respond. And I look back today and I said, man, if I would have just, if I would have did it or I wouldn't have did it, I can see how God would have made, I, things would have been different. I can see how, oh man, if I would have just passed that, I, did, I didn't know. I wasn't, I wasn't really aware of what he was trying to do. Uh, to me, it was about people, and it was about this person and my wife. And it was about, I, thought, I thought it was about because I was looking here. I didn't look up there. I, I didn't look, oh, in the eternal things beyond what I see. Because the devil was messing with my emotions. He was messing with my mind. He was messing. And when, you got, when the devil does that, you get rattled. And, and sometimes with that's why when we're bummed out, we walk with our head down. The devil tries to keep your head down. Don't look up. Don't look up. Because he's scared if you look up, you'll see the eternal things. You'll see that, that the things that are seen are temporal. That whatever you're going through and whatever you're taking place, it's, it's only for a season. And God said, if you pass this test, man, there are eternal things waiting for you. There's eternal things waiting for you and I. But it takes faith to believe that, and I didn't have that faith. I lacked the faith in that time of my life. I lacked the faith. I couldn't believe that God would do that. It was too overwhelming. It was too, it was too much. I seen too much. But I'm here to tell you tonight, listen, man, God wants those prayers to be fervent and hot. And if you're going through something, if you're going through something, God, God just, there's an eternal purpose. There's an eternal purpose. And don't let the devil lie to you. He wants, he wants to give you the desires of your heart, the Bible says. He wants to delight in him, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. But you got to let him prepare you for that. When God told me you weren't even ready for what I, what you were praying for, you weren't ready for. You're praying for husband, wife. You're praying for a good job that pay. You're not ready for. If God didn't answer, then you're not ready. And if you're not ready, then God, what are you doing? What are you doing? See, and that produces fervent prayer. What are you doing, God? Why? It produces passion in your prayers. And if you can stay in that mode of pursuing God, listen, you're not going to have a dry prayer. Because every prayer is going to go down with purpose. God, I want to do, I want to see the bigger picture. The bigger picture. The vision is what keeps fervency. I understand how a man of God can be driven by a vision. It's not just a lingo. It's being able to see what God wants to do, not only in his city, in his life, in his, in his state, or in the, in the world. It's being able to see what God wants, you, God wants you to do something mighty within your life and family. Let's start there. Within your life and within your family. If you can think big there. If you can think big there, then you're going to see God take you to another level. Amen? Let's pray, Father, I come before you. And God, I just thank you, Lord God, for you. And God, we just come, Lord God, we acknowledge you. We acknowledge you, God, that you are the one that is and was and always will be. There is none like you. Tonight, Lord God, we want to have that fervency in prayer. 
We surrender, God, to you, Lord, the sovereign God, that you are in control of all things. You're the one that has called us out of darkness. It's your mercy and grace is why we're here today. And so, God, we ask, God, that you would prepare our hearts. Prepare, Lord God, our hearts, our minds, our emotions. And take us into the holies of holies, Father. Let this be holy ground here tonight. In Jesus' name.